We previously introduced orthogonal matrices. It's a special type of matrix that, when multiplied by its transpose, yields the identity. In other words, an orthogonal matrix is a matrix whose inverse is its transpose. I'll leave a link in the description to the video where we go over those. We also went over some examples of orthogonal matrices, such as the standard matrix for reflection and the standard matrix for a rotation. And in this video, we're going to talk about rotations a lot more. The idea is that if we take the xy plane, which we can imagine is being created by two unit basis vectors on the x axis and the y axis. If we take these axes and then we rotate them counterclockwise, then we've also rotated those basis vectors. But even after rotation, they're still unit vectors and they're still orthogonal to each other. So in that way, we transition from one set of orthonormal basis vectors to a new set of orthonormal basis vectors. The transition matrix involved in a transition like that has to be an orthogonal matrix, which this theorem tells us. Us. I'll leave a link in the description to a separate video where we prove this theorem. For now, let's read it. Let V be a finite dimensional inner product space. If P is the transition matrix from one orthonormal basis for V to another orthonormal basis for V, then P is an orthogonal matrix. So like I said, the transition matrix necessary to rotate our usual orthonormal basis vectors for R squared that will be an orthogonal matrix. Let's explore what that orthogonal transition matrix would be with the help of a picture. So here we have an x, y coordinate system. And you can imagine we rotate it counterclockwise through an angle theta. That gives us this new x prime, y prime coordinate system. And keep in mind, we're not rotating the points or the vectors in the space, we're just rotating the axes. And so we might ask, how do we express, for example, this point Q in terms of the new rotated basis vectors? It might have had coordinates x, y with respect to the original x, y axes, but if we rotate those axes, certainly it will have a different set of coordinates with respect to those new rotated axes, x prime and y prime. In order to figure out how to express a point with respect to these new rotated axes, we need a transition matrix. And hopefully you recall how to find a transition matrix. And if you don't, well, let me remind you. Suppose we have these unit basis vectors u1 and u2 along the original xy axes. So these are your typical set of orthonormal standard basis vectors for two space. And then after the rotation of the axes, we have these new basis vectors, u1 prime and u2 prime. They're orthogonal to each other and they also have lengths of one. Then the coordinates x prime y prime of a vector after the rotation of the axes can be found by taking our transition matrix and multiplying it by the original coordinates of the vector. So we're looking for this transition matrix P from the old basis, U1, U2, to the new basis, U1 prime, U2 prime, that's with respect to that new set of rotated axes. And what is that transition matrix P? Well, it's this. It's the matrix whose columns consist of the old basis vectors with respect to the new basis, u1 with respect to the basis b prime, u2 with respect to the new basis b prime. So we need to express the old basis vectors in terms of the new bases, and then we can use those as the columns for our transition matrix. Expressing the old basis vectors in terms of the new basis just takes a little bit of trigonometry. Looking at u1 first, for example, we have to ask how much of u1 prime do we need? How much do we have to go in that direction? And how much of u2 prime do we need? How much do we have to go in this vertical direction? Clearly the amount of u1 prime is positive and the amount of u2 prime is negative to express this basis vector u1. But let's break out some trig to see exactly what it is. In the direction of u1 prime we have to travel cosine theta. Theta is the angle that we've rotated the axes through, and cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent 
over hypotenuse. And remember, the hypotenuse is this unit vector u1 from the original basis. So if we take cosine theta, we're really just going to get that adjacent side that we're looking for. That tells us the horizontal distance or the distance along the x prime axis, or more specifically, the amount of u1 prime that we need to express u1. As for the amount of u2 prime that we need, that's negative sine theta, because sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse. And again, the hypotenuse has a length of 1, so that's just going to capture this negative vertical distance that we need. So there's the original basis vector u1 with respect to the new basis b prime. We have cosine theta, that's how far along x prime we need to travel, and negative sine theta, that's how far along y prime we need to travel. So that's the old basis vector u1 in terms of the new basis. We can do a similar thing for u2. How far along in the horizontal x prime direction do we need to go for u2? Well, that's sine theta. We're looking at this triangle right now. Because sine theta is going to be opposite over hypotenuse. Now, the opposite side is that horizontal distance we need, that distance along x prime. But the hypotenuse is the unit vector u2. So if we take sine theta, we're just going to get that opposite distance that we need. As for the vertical distance, the distance along y prime, that's just going to be cosine theta. Because cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. So it's just going to be this adjacent distance that we need. So there's u2 in terms of the new basis. Sine theta, that's the horizontal x prime distance. And cosine theta, that's the vertical y prime distance. And now we can build our transition matrix P using these as the column vectors, the old basis vectors with respect to the new basis. That's how we build the transition matrix. So using those re-expressed basis vectors, we make this transition matrix matrix P. Thus, the new coordinates of any vector with respect to these rotated axes can be found by multiplying that transition matrix by the original coordinates x and y. Doing the multiplication gives us this set of equations, which are sometimes called the rotation equations for r squared. You might also notice that this transition matrix for a rotation of the axes through an angle theta is actually the same as the transition matrix for rotation of all of the vectors in r squared through an angle of negative theta. Because, for example, looking back at this picture with the point q, look at how q is in relation to the new axes after that rotation. If instead of rotating the axes counterclockwise through theta, we had rotated q through an angle of negative theta, it would be, you know, around down here, and it would look just like it did after the rotation of the axes with respect to the unrotated axes. So that transition matrix of rotating the axes through an angle theta, that's just like rotating the points or vectors in the space through an angle of negative theta. Walking through a quick example, let's say we want to find the new coordinates of the point 2, 1 after rotating the xy coordinate system counterclockwise through the angle pi over 3. So the original coordinates are 2, 1. The new coordinates after rotation of the axes can be found by taking the transition matrix with theta equals pi over 3 plugged in and multiplying it by those old coordinates, 2, 1. Now, you've got to know your unit circle. Cosine of pi over 3 is a half, sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2, and so on. That's the transition matrix for this angle. And then we just do the multiplication. So we end up getting 1 plus root 3 over 2, and then we have negative root 3 plus one half. So without moving this point Q at all, if we had rotated the axes through an angle of pi over 3, we could express the point Q in terms of those new axes with this vector. Again, we're rotating the axes, not the points. So in terms of the old axes, these are the coordinates of Q. But in terms of the new axes, these would be the coordinates of Q. But the point Q is in the same exact place. We can actually apply everything we just did to a rotation in three space as well. Imagine we have our x, y, z coordinate system, and then we keep the z axis fixed 
but rotate about the z-axis counterclockwise. So the x-axis gets rotated and the y-axis gets rotated, but they're rotating around the z-axis, which is held fixed. The transition matrix for this rotation of axes looks like this. This top part is the same exact transition matrix that we had before, which shouldn't be surprising because in this situation, it's only the x and y axes which are being rotated. The z axis is held fixed. The unit vector along the x axis and the unit vector along the y axis both have to get changed in the same way as before, and we're not changing the fact that they have z coordinates of zero. Meanwhile, the unit vector u3 along the z axis well, that's not going to get changed at all because the z-axis is held fixed. So if we have a point x, y, z, and we've rotated the x, y, z axes, we can express that point relative to the new axes without moving the point at all. We can express it with respect to those new axes by taking those old coordinates and multiplying it by this transition matrix. Then these are the rotation equations for r cubed. Let's go ahead and do a quick example. Suppose we want to find the new coordinates of the point negative 2, 1, 3 after rotating the XYZ coordinate system counterclockwise around its z-axis through an angle of pi over 4. Then the original point has coordinates negative 2, 1, 3, so we're going to multiply this by the transition matrix for a rotation about the z-axis, and we're plugging in theta equals pi over 4. Again, you've got to know your unit circle. We can replace all of those with their known values, root 2 over 2 and negative root 2 over 2 in the case of the negative sign there. And then just do the multiplication, and we get this new vector. So after rotating the axes, this point, without moving at all, can be expressed in terms of those new rotated axes with these coordinates. In each of these cases, we are transitioning from one set of orthonormal basis vectors to a new set of orthonormal basis vectors. So both of these transition matrices have to be orthogonal matrices. And you could verify that if you take this matrix and multiply it by its transpose, you'll get the identity. If you take this matrix and multiply it by its transpose, you'll also get the identity. They are orthogonal matrices. So those are a couple of examples of transitions between orthonormal bases with rotations of axes. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to check out my Linear Algebra course and Linear Algebra Exercises playlists in the description for more. If you find my videos helpful, please consider supporting what I do by joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can get early and exclusive access to select videos, and if you join at the premium tier or above, you can access the lecture notes used in this course. Thanks for watching. Stressed out, sweetie, I'm stressed out. Sounds like you've been stressed out. Tell me what you're stressed about. Love. Stressed out, honey, I've been stressed out. Lately, don't know what's what. Don't know what I'm stressed about. Stressed out, sweetie, I'm stressed out. Sounds like you've been stressed out. Tell me what's